What up, y'all? Rap Critic here, and this was a Patreon-voted episode. That's right, this episode was brought to you by my Patreon voters. And if you want to be one of them, head on over to patreon.com slash rapcritic, where at the $5 pledge, you can be a part of the What You Think talkback section at the end of this video, as well as vote on episodes, join the Discord, and get in on private streams, first access to podcasts, and all the stuff I'll be doing when I take this November off from Rap Critic episodes. As well, for live stream music requests or private notes on your music, head on over to ko-fi.com slash rapcritic. Oh yeah, if you got a song you want me to listen to or an album you want me to check out or if there's an artist you've wanted to get into but wanted a playlist so you could streamline their best material to get acclimated to what they do send a request through and hey if there's some indie rappers out there that want someone to give them some private notes on their music but you know it's kind of awkward to ask a friend about it yo shoot a track my way just go to kofi.com slash rap critic now and get your requests in so let's talk about the kendrick versus drake battle one more time because recently j cole released port antonio not so much a response as a reflection on the way the beef played out and when I checked it out, it felt like he was attempting to extend an olive branch between the artists after how nasty things got. But the internet's been really split on how they feel about it. Partially because, sure, the peanut gallery loves a fight and you're always going to get a loud contingent of folks who are going to boo at anyone trying to go against the grain. But also because, honestly, I think J. Cole legit kind of fumbled how he addressed the issue. Because to back things up, this whole thing started with J. Cole actually shouting out the three of them as great MCs on First Person Shooter. We the big three like we started a league. But then Kung Fu Kenny came through with his feature on Futures like that record to say no we're not lyrical equals kendrick is the king of the hill Motherfuck the big three nigga it's just big me now like i said before i don't think this was a serious retort to j cole he was doing the thing all rappers do you gotta flex and puff out your chest and act like you're the goat it's what the braggadacious spirit of rapping calls each rapper to do when they're writing the rhymes and that's how it felt like to me with j cole's first song kicking off the full-blown diss tracks like hey we're not actually airing out grievances at each other it's just a large-scale roasting session where we're gonna joke on each other's personas However, a couple days after releasing his track 7 Minute Drill, before anything else dropped, J. Cole retracted his song, telling a crowd at his latest show that he didn't like what he ended up making. Yeah, I feel, spiritually feel bad on me. Like, like, I try to like, jab my nigga back, and I try to keep it friendly, but at the end of the day, when I listen to it, and when it comes out, and I see the talk, that shit don't sit right with my spirit, that shit make me feel... That shit disrupts my fucking peace. And I get what he means, right? Like, even with the understanding that this is a rap battle for entertainment, you still gotta say mean stuff about the guys that you actually respect, and that might have felt awkward for him. Now that brings us to today's track, Port Antonio. And a lot of people are seeing this track as J. Cole playing Captain Hindsight and acting like he knew things were gonna get bad all along. I pulled the plug because I see where that was about to go. But eh, I can imagine after retracting seven minute drill and seeing how things played out, Cole might be feeling like his intuition is now retroactively justified. Cause yeah, this is hip hop. It's pretty notorious for unchecked egos escalating things. But even taking into account the idea that things should stay on wax and it's all in the spirit of hip hop's competitive nature, I think what's really rubbing folks the wrong way is when they they hear him say this on Port Antonio. They see this fire in my pen and think I'm dodging smoke. I wouldn't have lost the battle, dog. I would have lost the bro. I would have gained the fold. Like, nah, I, I totally would have lost that battle. I for sure could have destroyed them if I wanted to. But see, see, I just chose peace. Problem is, we did hear what he dropped when he tried to get at Kendrick. And I'm sorry, but the fact of the matter is, Kendrick would have eaten that shit for lunch. No second shit put niggas to sleep, but they gassed it. Uh, really? Your claim is that Kendrick's second album, To Pimp a Butterfly, was putting people to sleep with this? This dick ain't free. Matter of fact, it need inches. Matter of fact, it's nine inches. Really now, the, the, that was the boring one. See, as much as I remember at first thinking J. Cole's diss tracks weren't that bad lyrically, when I go through to see what the actual jabs were, the overall effort was a love tap at best. And look, of course he had to say afterwards that, oh, I totally would have gotten at you though, you know, it's hip hop, so I get him trying to save face, but it's in the context of what we've actually already heard, so reality runs up against your ability to take him at face value. Cause like, if J. Cole's track was this furious takedown that he retracted, him pulling it from streaming would have come across as even more of a, oh man, what am I doing? This doesn't feel right. But since we've all heard how weak it was it comes off more like a toothless shark claiming to be a good guy because he says he'll never bite you and i'm sorry but you don't get props for declaring that you're not gonna do something that we have proof you weren't gonna be able to do anyways see the problem with all this hip-hop theater is you have to be perceived as believable with what you're saying and when it comes to a battle it's not about what's true it's about what can be perceived as true with the drake vs kendrick situation the reason why kenny won was because he made a consistently better more believable case for his attacks with J. Cole, though, his jabs on 7-Minute Drill just did not connect. 
When Kendrick says, you've got another kid on Meet the Grams, the reputation of Drake is already tarnished to begin with on that front, so it stands to reason you could believe this too. Versus J. Cole trying to say Kendrick's to Pimple Butterfly was boring, that's just demonstrably not true. Protect the legacies, so lines got crossed, perhaps regrettably. Now, this line seems a little bit more on the money in terms of the reasoning for why J. Cole, Kendrick, and Drake did what they did. With Drake's first back-to-back -back tracks, it, it felt like an ego thing of, okay, you know, I'm not gonna let the critical darling just keep talking shit. The pop star pretty boy is still willing to get his hands dirty on some rap shit, so what are you gonna do, brother, when I show that I can drop two tracks in a row? And with Kendrick, it felt like, oh, oh okay, you, you wanna intimidate me with the turnaround time on releasing multiple tracks in less than a week? Oh, okay, bet, I see you when I raise you. And here's the thing, it didn't automatically have to be low blows in order for the shit to be, you know, no entertaining beef for the cameras. And in fact, I'd say Drake's and Kendrick's first tracks, for the most part, did that pretty well. Drake is lobbing short guy jokes, Kendrick's hitting the back with you're a pop star pretending to be hard but you don't even write your own shit, it was mostly all above board. Although some people have brought up the veiled references that preceded some of the bigger Fallout tracks. Like for example, Drake's proclivities for teenage girls with Kendrick's first song title, Euphoria. Or then Drake making a mention of needing bodyguards like Whitney as a reference to Kendrick's wife Whitney possibly having an affair. But at the end of the day, when you look at the context, those specific earlier references in a vacuum serve as more like resting landmines they could plausibly deny the meetings of if things didn't get worse. A dog whistle to what might be hiding in their back pocket. And sure, there was the line where Kendrick gestured at Drake being a deadbeat dad to his first kid, but that was not info the public didn't already know, you know? It wasn't until Drake took that line to heart and used it as the now you've gone too far reasoning for him to mudsling with the Family Matters track, which is what makes how things played out such an epic tragedy, because it made Kendrick go, oh, oh, you thought me calling you a deadbeat dad was me picking on your offspring? Okay, no, buddy, let me actually talk about what folks don't know when he dropped Meet the Grams. Now, I don't think it would have been what Drake versus Kendrick turned into, but even on an above-the-belt roasting session, J. Cole's attempt at a diss wasn't anything Kendrick couldn't have handled eight ways to Sunday. But at this point, it'd be cold-blooded for Kendrick to really flame on someone who's waving the white flag, so when J. Cole says this on Port Antonio after pulling seven-minute drill, I wouldn't lost the batter, dog. I would have lost the bro. Yeah, that shit just comes off like a nigga selling wolf tickets. Another problem with interpreting these lyrics is I do get the feeling J. Cole's being vague in some parts so as to not directly implicate one rapper versus the other in terms of who was really doing what that might have pushed things too far. They wanted blood, they wanted clicks to make their pockets grow. Like, okay, if he's talking about the internet drama chasers who immediately jump on everything for content, sure. But the context here seems to be that he's insinuating that that's what Drake and Kendrick were doing this whole time. Can I get it if I see it's about the dome? They instigate the fuckery because it's profitable. Jermaine is no king, if that means I gotta dig up dirt and pay the whole team of algorithm bot niggas just to sway the whole thing. And like, I distinctly remember it being Drake who was accused of tipping off social media stars to react to his tracks when they dropped, as well as using bots and memes to push perception in his favor. In fact, as far as Kendrick was concerned, it seemed like he just sort of dropped the tracks and let him breathe, so that perception also ended up making Drake look like the guy who was flop sweating around to manipulate the algorithm. That said, I understand J. Cole wanting to downplay that to cut through to a true out of this, but it still feels like a slippery means to get there, because you're using the example of, well, everyone was doing this, weren't they, when public perception of the situation doesn't really bear that out. Also, an odd wrinkle to the issue is Cole's diss was only directed at Kendrick, so the fact that the lyrics mainly seem to be shouting out Drake near the end strikes a weird tone. They say I'm picking sides, they don't you lie on me, my nigga. To start another war, hey, Drake, you'll always be my nigga. I ain't ashamed to say you did a lot for me, my nigga. Because he doesn't really directly address Kendrick anymore after this bit to make it clear he's talking to both of them about how he appreciates them, it seems like he's mostly addressing Drake with these kinds of lyrics. Tapping back into your magic pen is what's imperative. Like, no one's thinking that Kendrick isn't tapped into his magic pen right now, that's mostly how people are thinking about Drake. Although, from a sympathetic perspective, it makes sense. It's clearly the public perception that Drake lost, so I can see wanting to be more trying to console the guy who lost rather than the dude who's definitely doing fine. Fuck all the narratives. And to the extent that he's also addressing Kendrick, I feel like this line is him trying to be above the fuckery of the rumors being thrown. Because as much as everyone wants to make the soy jack pointing face at every unsubstantiated claim, the fact of the matter is, nothing said in a song has so far been proved in a court of law, at least not to the same degree certain other celebrities have been definitively proved of. So okay, I can see this line being an attempt at maturity by looking past everything that's been said in general and prioritizing coming to an accord to get things back on the positive side of creating music. It's for speaking our thoughts, pushing ourselves, reaching the charts, emotions to touch, something is so overall I give it a 3 out of 5. It's a bit wobbly in terms of execution, but I get the feeling his heart was still in the right place in terms of intention with the track. Uh, Cole tries to play the mediator, but it's like he's more focused on keeping the peace than really grappling with the issues to materially make the impact that he wanted. However, in the heat of the moment of trying to ease tensions, I can respect that he wanted to try to think of something to do to address things in an amicable way, and while it might be a little sloppy, I can appreciate the attempt at trying to be peacekeeper regardless of how well it's pulled off. Well, that's 
that's what I thought of it. But hey, let's take a look at the what you think five dollar talk back section where you get to sound off on your opinion of the song. And if I dig it, I'll include it in the video. Today's response comes from Life is Strange, great video game by the way, who says, I love it when hip hop songs have a piano playing in the background. Uh, this reminds me of YG's Who Do You Love and Mob Deep's Quiet Storm. J. Cole is in top form with his dark storytelling. Y yeah, okay, that first verse actually was pretty solid. Uh, it's refreshing to hear a song like this in the the 20s uh, all right i guess we are in the 20s uh that sounds more old school and isn't going for the done to death amigos-esque trap rap sound Ooh, okay not crazy about the weird chipmunk sounding background vocals though as they sound very out of place other than that great song you know i get enjoying it but to me it felt a bit too much like he was redoing the dead president's beat that he'd already wrapped over but you know it is a pretty infamous sample that sounds really good and moody but you know, it hasn't been so overused that it's become worn out like that last song review i did uh, check out my review for back to the hotel on that overused sax well, that's the episode. And if you want to support the show, of course, that's ko-fi.com slash rapcritic for one-time donations where you can request live streams or reviews and patreon.com slash rapcritic for ongoing payments where you can see episodes early, get half off on Kofi requests, and join the RC Discord to chat with me and fellow fans. And until next time, I'm the Rap Critic. You don't have to like my opinion, but I don't have to like your song, even if you are trying to do the right thing. <laughs>